The good old clap, take one. That's right. How many of you knew what you wanted to be when you were seven years old? I did. I wanted to be world champion. Hey, is there honesty involved in this podcast? Can we be honest? We can shut your fucking lips. And then I'll just say, put them up once. Let's go. He's like, you look too pretty on the wave. Get ugly. We can talk about DMT if you want. It's like you're boxing. All right, so we are here. We've made it. It's the end of the year for the lineup. It was uh, it was an amazing year, thinking back on everything that happened. And uh, as is now tradition, we are here for our end of the year mailbag, uh, put together by our relatively new producer, Miguel Clemente. Thank you, Miguel. Um, but before we get to the, the listener mailbag questions, it's probably worth getting to know uh, who puts this podcast together. We've had some really great people who've worked on this project over the last couple of years. We had Ryan Fawcett and Henry Beyer, who served as producers. And now, um, well, at least as of October, this is the Miguel Clemente show. So we're very lucky to have you, Miguel. Um, I'm excited to see uh, what you do with your time here. But before we get into the listener mailbag, Miguel, give the listeners just a little bit of background. Who are you and where did you come from? Oh, great. Well, thanks for having me, Dave. Um, I didn't know that uh, jumping on this podcast would eventually land me on the podcast. So that's very, very interesting and fun. But I'm just a fan. At the end of the day, a year ago, I was listening to this podcast, um, you know, and, and now here I am in the background and it's been amazing. <laughs> it's that easy, everyone. Just right? a well, straight line from from enjoy to go there. I, I really like it. Well, what? But what was your surfing experience prior to coming to work for the WSL? Uh, honestly, not much. It was I caught my first wave, caught the stoke, fell in love, and you know I was working a bunch of odd jobs, and you know friends and family that listen to this are gonna laugh at this, but. You know, it's just kind of that idea of like waking up and like, what am I doing? Like, I, you know, and maybe not odd jobs or just jobs I just didn't really like. Um, that probably wasn't right worth. But, um, you know, I just kind of started asking my question, like, what is it that's going to bring me excitement when I wake up and go to work? And the WSL just kept coming to my mind and I reached out to someone in the team. Shout out, Jason. And um, he connected me to someone else in the, team, uh, in the team. And now here I am. So not much surfing experience, just fell in love with it. And yeah. I, I, you know, we always get that question where people are like, I don't surf at all. Can I work there? Or on the other side, like, I only surf. Can I work there? And I think it's like the best kind of company, at least for what we do, is you get a blend of both, right? You get people yeah. that are on the inside that can flex and look outside and people from the outside that can flex and look inside. And, and like, you just end up having a nice mix of, of, of opinion and perspective, which is really important. If, right. if you could achieve one thing as producer of this podcast, what would it be? I know I'm putting you on the spot. So you... <laughs> oh man, um, it's it's not really up to me, but I was talking to Megan, my girlfriend, about this earlier, and I was like, you know, it'd be really awesome if just like something, some soundbite or something that we did on the podcast just went like viral <laughs> and just went everywhere. Um, I don't know if that's the one thing I'd want to achieve, but it was just the first thing that came to my mind. We need like our our Mick Fanning shark attack moment of virality exactly. for for the podcast. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I'm, exactly. We'll work, we'll work mean, on it. We're gonna... You're surfing up north, so you know, just take a camera out with you. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, it, I'm glad you. I'm glad you. Uh, brought up sharks with surfing up north and and for the record there's no cameras allowed up here so it's that's the way we like it but those oh, are those are right. great great <laughs> answers miguel and um and with that um you know the keys are yours and and so we'll let you lead on the on the mailbag questions absolutely well again thank you dave and uh thanks to everyone that wrote in questions at at the lineup pod on instagram um as dave often says but it's very true especially for this one we got a ton back um, so we're going to do our best to answer all of them today. If not, um, you know, reach out to us, DM us, and we'll try to get back to you directly there. Um, with that said, I figured we'd kind of break this up into different segments. And the first segment be kind of like a look back. The second be kind of more hard hitting, maybe even controversial questions. And then the <laughs> third segment being more like uh, looking ahead and look forward. Um, so let's dive in. You ready, Dave? That sounds very organized. Let's go for it. That's what I do. Uh, all right, so first question comes from at Wes Weber 4. Dave, what are your personal highlights of the year? 
Personal highlights for the year. Okay, so starting with the big questions. Um, um, uh, well, on the on the personal professional side, I I was fortunate enough to go to the Quicksilver Pro G Land, um, which was really mm. special for me. Um, it's the kind of place that uh, really epitomized Rabbit's Dream Tour concept from from when I was a kid, you know, back in the '90s. And uh, but it hadn't been back on, on the CT calendar until this year, so. It was uh, it was really special and amazing and uh, fortunate to be on the ground for that event. You know the waves obviously weren't very good for the contest relative to what they could have been, but they were pretty good waves for civilians like myself up the reef at Kongs every day. And it was just uh, it's a really special experience being there and and feeling the history and the heritage and just meeting uh, the people that are there. Uh, you know, it was a shame it won't be back on the calendar for 2023, but maybe it will again in the future. It'd be awesome to go back. And then yeah. um, on the personal, personal side, I mean, I don't, I mean, just any day I get to spend with my kids, you know, they're amazing. So that's always a highlight and they're sick today, but it's still a still yeah. highlight. I enjoy, enjoy being a nurse. So cool. Um, let's see. Next one then at Mia Fuku, who was your favorite person on the pod? My favorite person on the pod. Okay, well, I get um, I get asked this a lot, and I I don't ever have a good answer. Um, you know, they're all different. They all have their own style and approach to these conversations. Um, for 2022, I think we started the year with Santa Cruz is Nat Young, um, and that was great. I mean, the 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 surfing world historically has you know had a heavy hand on on over engineering image for young talent, so getting to talk to people who have gone through that and have had to actually, you know, venture out into the world on their own. Um, they generally have something really interesting to say. And, and Nat has an amazing story and, you know, other people that come to mind in that space are Julian Wilson and, and Nathan Hedge. And then, you know, getting someone like Tatiana Weston Webb to talk about being one turn away from claiming the 2021 world title and, and what that did to her, I thought, it was really brave. And I think for a lot of people, something that is really helpful to listen to and, you know, similar in hearing something from Macy Callahan about falling off mm -hmm. tour and requalifying by the challenger series. And then, you know, there's people like Justin Gain and Jeff Booth and Sean Thompson and Mike Parsons, Greg McGillivray, you know, like storytellers yeah. and, and people who've done so much. And I'm sure I'm forgetting like so many people, it's all pretty blurry, but <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, that's my, my non-answer for this question. But what yeah. about, what about, what about you, Miguel? What was your, who's your favorite person on the pod from this year? Yeah, I'll add to that. I think if I had to look back and think about it, um, man, Chumbo, Lucas Chianca having him, mm. He was it great. Was, uh, yeah, he was amazing. And just his stoke and his like attitude for life. I remember it was like right after he had his baby girl and you would ask him, um, you know, like does paddling out on these big waves make you think twice? And he said something about like, if anything, it makes me work twice as hard. Mm -hmm. And I was just like, wow. Like, you know, all the people that you mentioned, there's kind of this uh, through line thread that's um, kind of unifying everyone and that's kind of like the stoke and this this desire to be more present and um, yeah he just had a great great episode so everyone should check that out that's um, a good one otherwise, good job yeah. producer Miguel <laughs> that's a good <laughs> yeah answer. for sure no thanks um, on the women's side though uh, Soleil Erica was really really fun she had just won her second world title at Malibu so yeah that was a cool one that's a good one too <laughs> cool. Uh, third question uh, at Chris dot Fowler dot one eight seven. Is there still what was the ASP banquet and champ awards should be streamed? What do you think, Dave? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think. Um, yes, isn't that the question? Uh, yeah, yeah. There, there is a WSL awards. There, there hasn't been for a couple of years because of COVID. Um, but we are planning on having it again before the 2023 CT kicks off in Hawaii. Um, you know, the streaming thing is interesting, like as far as like content goes, the, the WSL awards and which is previously the ASP banquet is typically the, the formal crowning of the past season's world champions. So it's not, mm. it's not a surprise kind of situation in terms of awards, it's not like the Oscars or anything. You kind of know who's going to win. There's, there's usually a couple awards that are a mystery, but it is 
in my experience, it's like it's a super special night where it's maybe the only night where you get the best surfers on the planet all into a room and they're really there for each other and they're there to mm-hmm. honor the best surfers from the previous season. And and it's yeah, sometimes the speeches are amazing. And so I could I could see the value of people wanting to watch it. I just I think it just has to be like presented appropriately where it's not like hey we're not here to kind of like hide the football and you don't know who's going to win like you know who's going to win you're here to kind of see this really rare instance where you have this convergence of talent and how they act with one another in an otherwise exclusive kind of setting so so yeah that's that's actually a pretty good question i we'll see what happens with uh next year's awards yeah how did the public get access to it in the past it's been streamed in the past it's just gone through like a bunch of different like Mm -hmm versions um mm. and we, we like sold, used to sell tickets it used to be in australia um when we had the the when the ct season started on the gold coast and so it's sort of expanded yeah. into like big public events like oscars light stuff and then even when it was it was always kind of like the, the 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 identity of it and the soul of it was always just hey here here is the best surfers in the world they're all in a room they're actually yeah. kind of speaking truth to each other in a way. Like some of the speeches are just like bring you to tears and it, it's a tension, right? Because in a way, like you make that more public or you stream it or whatever, and you start to kind of compromise the intimacy that, that allows mm. those kind of moments. Mm. Um, but at the same time, if those moments happen and no one gets to experience them, that's kind of a yeah. miss as well. So I think it's, it's kind of navigating that tension in terms of, of what we do moving forward. Interesting. I'm glad we're bringing it back, though. I do think it's a really yeah. important thing. So, yeah, I'm excited. Uh, yeah. Cool. Next question comes from Too Cool for Megan. Um, she asks, "How do you guys choose your event spots for the tours?" And a little sub question there, because we actually got a few questions about Surf Ranch. Um, is how is Surf Ranch picked even as a venue? Okay. Um, yeah. Th- I mean, those are good questions. Um, and the selection process does change a little bit depending on the tier. But for the championship tour, there are you know a number of variables that go into calendar decisions. The tours and competition office, which is headed up by Jesse Miley Dyer, design the calendar to ensure that you know the schedule offers a diverse array of world class waves to test the overall best surfers on the planet. And for sure, you know, I often get random comments that say like all 10 events should be held at like 20 foot Chopo or something, which, you know, it's, that's an opinion, but, but it's, it's not one shared by the world's best surfers in determining, you know, the comprehensive best surfers of the season. Like it, the, the way to do it as far as we've designed it so far, which I do think works really well is you want a variety of world-class waves. You want rights, you want lefts, right. you want reefs and beaches and barrels and high performance waves. And, and just to kind of test surfers across as, as wide a range of conditions as possible. So, so yeah, so the tours and competition office works with the surfers reps. And then that list gets put through things like, you know, partnerships, assessment, finance, operations, like making sure we have a nice regional balance, um, you know, to make sure that all of that can actually happen, you know, instead of just dream casting on a whiteboard, which is probably what I get accused of doing too often. But yeah, it's always important to make sure we can actually do the thing. And um, yeah, I think the schedule we have moving forward looks really, really strong. And I think we're going to see continued kind of optimization and, and, and really special stuff happening in future years on the CT side, which really so goes the CT, so goes all the tiers in a lot of ways. And then mm. on the surf ranch front, that's a good question too, you know, undoubtedly, you know, Surf Ranch and Lemoore is the best man-made wave on the planet and, and, but it does come with its own competitive challenges too. And I think if you look at all the CT venues on the schedule, you can probably take each one and, and, and distill everything down to a singular challenge for the surfers, you know, at Jeffrey's Bay, the challenge is the speed and pacing of the wave, right? Like, like how do you how do you navigate mm-hmm. that challenge to make sure that you're performing your best at a place like Chopu? It's the commitment of the drop. Like, you know, you hear the mm-hmm. world's best surfers say it's it's a relatively simple wave to surf after that element. You know, you set your line. Once you make the drop, you set your line and you navigate the barrel, and it works or yeah. it doesn't. But 
the singular challenge there is the commitment and 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 identifying when and how and where to drop in on that that wave yeah. and it, at surf ranch it it's sort of come to the surface over the last few years of the challenge there it's it's just a pressure cooker you know that it's it's mm-hmm. unique in that there's a finite amount of waves you get two waves or four waves or whatever it is during your round or your heat and you either deliver on those waves or you you kind of melt under the pressure and melting under the pressure could look like you surf that wave way too conservatively or you fell, yeah. you know, and it's not one of those yeah. things like it's in the ocean where it's like, oh, I fell. I'm going to go get another one. Like, that's yeah. it. Um, so I think in terms of like going back to the overall design of the CT, it's a very cool element to introduce in terms of, yeah, the challenge here is like sort of like unparalleled pressure of like you have to perform or you're you're done um yeah and 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 just the the finiteness of it in a way but you know miguel you, yeah. you're relatively new to the company and and relatively new in surf fandom like what do you think of the the surf ranch ct as a fan yeah i mean i think part of the benefit of being a producer on this podcast now is getting to hear is you can say whatever you want without repercussion Exactly. Um, no, it's uh, getting to hear a lot of uh, what the surfers think on the back end, and and even some of the people, um, you know, like Marcio Zuvi, he came on the pod, and mm, he sharp eyes. Another good guest. Good one. Great guest. Um, and he talked about. I think someone actually tossed us in on the Instagram questions, like, "What's the next level for surfing?" And he said, "It's going to be the the wave pools." Mm. And I kind of thought about that. I was like, "Really? Like, I mean, I guess." But why could it be? And he explained it that like the wave is so consistent that he's going to be able to dial in his boards to the T for his surfers. And so I kind of see it in a way where it's like, okay, the wave pools are these places that, you know, if they're built all over the country or in places where people don't have access to oceans or waves, etc., they can really learn how to surf and surf well on these wave pools. And then when they come onto the tour and they have to surf at beach breaks or reef breaks or wherever it is, that's where they really get to put a lot of that skill and knowledge to the test. But kind of like what you said about the variety, the real test, you know, I, I can see why some people like when you just, you know, pipeline this year was like my eyes were glued to my phone watching mm. that, you know, um, cause it was just such an incredible event. Um, and so you, you know, some waves you're just like, Oh, I want to see that. I want to see that. And, you know, you can say whatever you want about, you know, for example, lowers, you know, we get a lot of stuff about that too, but it's, I think at the end of the day, that was a decision made, as I understand it, with the surfers um, mm-hmm. and everyone, you know, the, with Jesse and in terms of what's the best place to have the finals, what's the most neutral wave to have the finals where anyone mm-hmm. can shine um, versus, you know, if we have it at pipe, it's like, well, the pipe specialists are obviously going to have the advantage there, etc. Um, so it's kind of cool to see that it's it's a variety again on the CT. It it challenges the surfers in different ways, and um, each event is going to be something something different. Like even with the judging, like I had no idea before this year that it was like oh at each different place there's there's different things that the judges are putting more yeah. emphasis on, and that was really cool to learn honestly. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, cool. Cool. Next question is where am I? Ah, from at RISREM33. Oh, interesting. Will there ever be another CT contest on the East Coast USA? We've never gotten that one before. Mm, yep, that's a good <laughs> question. Um, well, the last one, last CT we had on the East Coast of the US was the Quicksilver Pro New York in Long Island back in 2011. Um, it's actually, it's an event that almost didn't happen. Um, I was in Tahiti in August on finals day that year, and we got a call from Quicksilver saying that they had officially canceled the event, um, which was scheduled for like a week after that or something. So everyone on tour was planning on going from Tahiti to New York for the next stop of the tour, but a hurricane had hit the site and they were uh, canceling it under, you know, like what they called like a force majeure clause or the act of God kind of thing. And (laughs) then within like, I don't know, I maybe hours, maybe an hour, like within an hour of like letting everyone know it was canceled, the decision was reversed. And they were like, nope, we're just not doing, you know, the concert and the skateboarding, the surfing still happening. And we had to like run around and get everyone to uncancel their canceled flights. Um, 
and we were all heading to New York. And and the early rounds in terms of surf were kind of average, but then it ended up pumping, and it was a it was an awesome event, and just like a really cool opportunity to be in New York with the world's best surfers. And you know, f- as far as like the future events on the East Coast goes, you know, really boils down to those factors that we talked about before, like is there a wave that is good enough and reliable enough in a window that we can plan? You know, what's the sponsorship status? What are the permitting status? All those things that go into the sort of the, how the sausage is made of like running events matter. Um, You know, never say never, but, but, but candidly, I haven't had anything kind of come across my desk recently on, on the topic of a, an East coast USCT event, but it would be cool to go back. And there's obviously really yeah. great waves there. I think that the hurricane nature of getting really good surf on the East Coast presents a challenge in terms of scheduling. Mm-hmm. But, yeah. I mean, it worked in 2011. There's no reason why it wouldn't work again. Yeah, I uh, had a conversation with Nick on our IT team. He's from the East Coast there, and he said exactly that. Like, it's just so hard to to navigate, especially during, like, stormy seasons, et cetera. Because, um, you know, you're building infrastructure you know, just a couple of weeks, if not a couple of days before the event. And then it's, he said, it's funny, you kind of have to hurry up to set up and then you're hurry up, you're trying to hurry up to, to get out of there. <laughs> right. Well, that, and that was the funny thing about New York in 2011, where like, they're like, yeah. we're canceling the event, a hurricane hit it. We're like, didn't we need a hurricane for the waves? Like, what are you talking yeah. about? Like, yeah, it's like, what is this going on? <laughs> All right. Well, next question uh, comes from someone you might know, might have heard of. His name is at Ryan Fawcett. What's the biggest change inside the company since this time last year? Ryan Fawcett. Yep. Founding member of the lineup. Um, we miss him. What is What was his question? What is the biggest change in the company since last year? Yep. When did he leave? Was he, does he try to self-reference? I, I don't know. <laughs> I, no, he, no. he did. He, whenever he left, he left some pretty big shoes to fill. But um, I'm not, uh, to answer the question, I'm not sure if it's a like a 12-month change per se, but my answer would be kind of the continued focus on what we do best as a company, which is crown world champions Um, Mm. and stabilizing and optimizing the way we do that and sharpening the company and all of our resources and all of our projects around that core engine of like, what is the world's best surfing? Like, how do you create a platform for that and, and continue to make it better? And, you know, is it perfect yet? No, I don't think so. But I do think that that change it's been a pretty tectonic kind of philosophical adjustment for the company in the last, like I'd say probably two years. Um, and mm-hmm. one that I think is really, really working well. I think it's, it's good for us. Um, but I don't know you're new. Yeah. Miguel, what do you think? What, what's your answer? <laughs> what has been the biggest change inside the company since October? Uh, <laughs> since October, right? Um, well, I, I guess you guys hired me. That's a big one. Good point. That's Huge a good regret. answer. No notes. Do you regret it yet, Dave, or what? No, no. We'll, we'll see. You asked me again at the end of the podcast. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> well, Ryan, uh, thanks for sending in that question. I'm standing on your shoulders, so appreciate it. <laughs> uh, next question comes from at David, oh God, Bilefuss. David Bilefuss. Um, interesting question. He asks, uh, WSL gets a lot of criticism. Some constructive, some not. How do you keep it in perspective? We do, yeah. Thank you, David. Um, <laughs> well, Appreciate I mean, it. I yeah, I've been. I'll be in my 18th year next year. I, I only get to say 17 for a little longer, but I will say the the criticism thing. It's always been the case, you know. And I and from talking to people who are around since the start in '76, it always ha- it always was. Um, you know, I've said this before on the podcast, but. Like surfing, it's a community that fancies itself as anti-establishment. Um, and the WSL, even on its best day, represents a kind of establishment, you know? And now I, I do think that the WSL's best day is what we're talking about. It's when it stays focused on the business of stewarding the platform for the world's best surfers. Um, yeah. Which, you know, comparing where we were as a company at the ASP when I started in 05, 06, to where we are now, I would say unquestionably we're seeing exponentially better live surfing or surfing in the live arena on the championship tour and across all the tiers um and really none better than we've seen in the last two seasons and that's for a variety of factors but i think that is kind of you know our north star and you know and i do think like the criticism thing like 
I'm going to generalize, but it generally falls into like two big buckets that, that I get, which in the first bucket is, you know, we like things the way they were, um, mm. which, you know, I understand. Um, and I understand that change is, is hard. And I worked for the ASP when things were the way they were. And I like that too. Um, but, but that said, you know, as we've talked about a little bit on the podcast, but this is hardly a secret, like none of what was before was necessarily real in terms of a sustainable business. The ASP, we were, for all intents and purposes, we were a sport that was a mainstream marketing expression at the time of a really successful and robust endemic industry. Um, you know, there was not a lot of attention paid to the p &L and and frankly, um, the structure that existed back in the the oddies and the structure that existed prior never ever kind of paid for itself. It was it was a marketing expense. And what's happened since the acquisition, but specifically in the last couple of years with the redesign, has been to do something that that will work, that we can stabilize structurally, and that can be financially sustainable for a future generation of surfers, which has never been the case in nearly five decades of this sport. And all of that, all of that redesign has been done through the lens of honoring what I think our North Star is and what I think the company thinks its North Star is, which is this has to be the world's best surfing. Like this is what yeah. we do. Um, and I get it. I get that that's not for everyone and, and some people like it the way it was and won't move off of that. But I, I will stress that there despite all the criticism, despite all kind of the noise in the system, there's absolutely a, a lot of dedicated people at the company working really hard to, you know, continue to advance the sport of surfing for, for generations to come, you know, and that's, that's what I'll say about kind of the first general area of criticism. The second place of criticism essentially comes from fuck the WSL and professional surfing. Now, I am generalizing on those two spaces to save time um, and, and fully admit there's like layers right between them. Like the, it's a, it's a scale where there's kind of two, you can, you can hit a bunch of kind of iterations between those spaces. But you know, for this one of like, you know, I hate professional surfing. I hate the WSL. We get it. You know, this isn't what surfing is for you. And that's completely valid. Like surfing is really in sort of the, the eye of the individual. It's whatever you want it to be. But at the same time, we probably can't do much with suggestions like go kill yourself. So, you know, that's, that's <laughs> what is what it is. I mean, we could, but we probably don't want it. Um, so, yeah, yeah, so like the criticisms, <laughs> like it's a part of the gig. And, and frankly, frankly, uh, to be totally honest, like I think the criticism is really important in keeping us accountable and, and for us to kind of constantly push yeah. and strive to be better. But to, to David's question, like at the same time, you have to wade through a lot of misinformed and bad faith arguments out there to get to things that you can yeah. actually address and make a difference with. But that's okay, is what it is. Yeah, no, I mean, I'll, I'll add to that. I think at the end of the day, what brings us here is the stoke, right? Is that this is surfing, it's supposed to be fun. And, you know, with Sean Thompson on the podcast, um, you know, a couple months, I think now ago, and, you know, he was talking about sitting on the beach with a rabbit and just, you know, asking, well, what are you gonna do next? And I was like, I'm going to be a professional surfer. And it's like, okay, like, how do you, how do we make that happen then? Um, you know, and I think at the end of the day, yeah, like, we're not perfect. You know, a lot of people talk and I think it's frustrating even on my end, um, you know, coming in and, and not having any of those preconceived notions. You know, I was not a surfer like a year and a half ago. You know what I mean? So I didn't care if I was paddling out on a Jerry Lopez eight foot Costco board and, but I, I think, you know, at the end of the day, everyone out there is just trying to have fun and enjoy it. And, and um, I think that's, excuse me, how I kind of navigate this and keep it in perspective is like, all right, throughout all that, throughout the criticism, you know, th this is a company, there's a lot of responsibility, it's got to make money, et cetera, all that. But at the end of the day, like, we're, we're also trying to just have fun. Yeah, and I think that's a great way to look at it. And I mean, you're a talented guy. You could work anywhere. I'm less talented, but I, I'm not. I'm not immune to offers of working anywhere else. And <laughs> and maybe I will one day. But but when people are like, "You've been here for 17 years. Why are you still doing this?" I I like I, I kind of look at it. Don't sell yourself short. Well, yeah, no, that's fair. Well, that's an answer. That's that's HR's answer. I don't I don't get. I don't mess with them. But but like, but my personal, I have some agency. I'm not chained to the desk, Miguel. But like, the reason why yeah. I'm still here, I like I think like oh, yeah, I could do other things. But like, 
it is very, very cool when it works right. Because you're just creating yeah. conditions to see something that's never happened before. You know, for these men Absolutely. and women across these divisions, it's like that's really cool. Like, and I, I, yeah, I'd like to make more money at some point doing it. But it's like I don't know. Like, you can't put a price on the idea of like we created a structure. You saw these people come through the structure. They right. did battle against one another, and in 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 the most violent part of the most alien environment on the planet for humans in the ocean. And you yeah. see something transcendent and that's awesome. Like I, I, again, like I, you know, do I, I started as an intern. I was happy doing it for free. I'm still happy to be here. So I think, <laughs> yeah. I think that's the cool thing about it. Yeah, absolutely. And I should have maybe add this on to that first question of personal highlights, but you know, I was able, I was fortunate enough to work the, uh, the finals. Um, on the ground and to see Steph win her eighth title and Felipe win his first title and the energy on the beach was, I mean, I'll never forget that moment. I'll never forget seeing Steph like just on the beach, kind of, I don't know if she was crying or praying or what, but her head was down. Everyone just around her cheering her on and it, yeah, it was incredible. But anyway. It's awesome. A lot of great stuff happening. Yeah, it's so so awesome. Well, we're going to take a quick break to get a word in from our sponsors. And uh, when we come back, we'll have a couple more questions. We'll be right back. All right. Well, uh, that last question was actually a great segue into this uh, second segment of quote unquote more hard hitting, maybe more controversial questions. Um, we'll start with an easy one or a hard one, depending on how you see it. <laughs> But uh, <laughs> this first question is from at DanJC264, who asks, do you personally think or see surfing more as an art or a sport? Oh, yeah. thank you, Dan. Another big question to start the segment off. Um, <laughs> this is actually, it's actually kind of funny. I, I, years and years ago, I got drafted last minute into a public debate on this very topic of is surfing an art or a sport years ago, like on the Gold Coast. I think... I think Jesse Miley Dyer was supposed to be, she was like the surfer rep on tour. She's still competing. And she was supposed to be on one of the debate teams, the sports side, but canceled and then like volunteered me instead. So I like went from wherever <laughs> I was to th this place. And in any event, I remember I was on a team with um, Cool and Goddess Bruce Lee and then the um, acclaimed journalist Tim Baker was on the art side of things. Shaper Stuart Darcy was there. I honestly can't remember which side he was on. But long story short, um, yeah, I like I. It's a good question. Like, and I I think kind of the personally, I think the special thing about surfing is that, and I said this a little bit before the break, but like the identity of surfing is really in the eye of the individual. Like, if you mm. see it as an escape and or an art, that's what it is. If you see it as a sport, then that's what it is, and it can be all those things too. It could be anything you right. want it to be. And, and I really think that what you do see from the WSL, what you see on the championship tour, what you see in the big wave events or the longboard tour is absolutely an elevation of surfing as a sport. But I'd also say that virtually every single one of our competitors across those disciplines, they also surf for reasons that are not sport-based, you know? And mm -hmm. I think that's really beautiful. Like I, I doubt you see, you know, F1 drivers like, not competing and just doing, you know, left hand turns all day or whatever it is like, yeah. you know, because a lot of sports are hard work and maybe there's elements that are fun, but you know, they're not fun enough to go do when you're not getting paid for it. Whereas every single surfer on tour and every single surfer on the planet does it because it's fun and because it's whatever they want it to be to them. But yeah, that's my answer. It's a good question, but I, I, I would kind of answer in that it doesn't have to be defined as an either or. Is that what came out of the debate? I, you know, what was... my memory is kind of hazy because I think we were drinking beers during the public debate too. But I, I wouldn't, I think, I feel like that was kind of the like, we're going to argue this side, we're going to argue that side, then we're all going to come together and kind of agree that it's everything. <laughs> like, so maybe I'm, maybe I'm plagiarizing my point from 10 or 12 years ago, whatever it was. But yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, why can't it be both equally in a way? I mean, like, right now I'm, I'm really working on like my bottom turn and I'm looking at JJF and Ethan Ewing carve on their rails and I'm just like, that the art of how they carve is what makes them so great, I think, competitively in the sport. So, yeah, both, well, I think. totally. And it's kind of like, well, of course, like sport can be art. Can art be a sport? Like that kind of yeah. gets into like 
the the lesser ideals of humanity existentialism kind of, right <laughs> but, but well yeah but but yeah i, I mean and I, I do think that people are passionate about yeah categorization categorization here in a way because i think mm. surfing is a lot more than like a hobby for people that surf like it really is a part of people's identity so when it does get pigeonholed into one thing or another if that's not the exact right. thing that you look at it as, it's not just that, oh my gosh, this was my hobby or my interest and you, you this isn't what I thought it was. People right. take it personally. They're like, no, that's that's an expression of me. And yeah. I, I don't agree, you know? And so I, I get that people Absolutely. kind of want it to be specific and defined, especially as it grows and more and more people from like outside the core communities of surfing are exposed to it. Like yeah. I, I, it's just a human thing. I totally get it, but I really do think it is. No, yeah. It's it's whatever you want it to be. Yeah, no, you're right. Um, cool. Next question from at Ben underscore Fullarton. Does the incredibly tight race for women's CT qualification mean it's expansion time, Dave? <laughs> yeah, no, that's that's a good question. It's an ongoing question, you know, for sure. And and I'd say that. The Tours and Competition Office is constantly reviewing and analyzing, you know, global talent pools on both men's and women's sides and across disciplines and determining the right number of competitors at each level, going back to that that North Star again to create conditions for the best surfing on the planet. And I think Ben's right. You know, the qualification race for the 2023 Women's Championship Tour was really tight. Um, and and personally, it's it's awesome to see a broader pool of talent coming up through the ranks on the women's side. And I think that not only ultimately elevates the performance level overall, but but for sure, it has the potential to change the structure of the sport as well, um, if that's the right thing to do. You know, and, and fortunately, we have um, a really solid and 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 broad perspective kind of decision-making matrix at the company led, you know, in large part by Jesse and her team in tours competition. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, I hope so, uh, to jump in there. Yeah. You know, I'm still learning a lot of the different names, um, you know, as a relatively new surfer and new to the industry in a way, but you know, after seeing, you know, like Alyssa Spencer, Nikki, Teresa, Vahine, Amuro, Dimity, and even, I don't know how to pronounce her name, but I'm just going to say Evie Wong at Haleiwa. I was just like, oh my God, yeah, the, the talent. I don't know if it's the CS or what, or, but the talent level is insane across all disciplines and it's just increasing. Yeah. So I think it's honestly just a matter of time. And, um, you know, I guess it's one of those things where it's like we ask in a way that our fans um, and our audience to kind of bear with us as we, we go through these changes in a way. But I think, yeah, it, it's a matter of time. Yeah, well, and I mean, I think the other thing to think too, like, like I think you're right. There's a variety of factors that's, that have has led to kind of this moment where there's, it feels like a, a mega generational shift on the women's side with all these young women coming up, and they're so so good. But credit where credit's due. Like after the acquisition, you know, the ownership group really invested in leveling out the quality of venues at the women's championship tour level. You know, right. they added Fiji back on, Trestles back on. They brought Honolulu Bay back for the women immediately, and then yeah. you know, years later, um, we're now at a place where. Every single event is a shared event on the Challenger right. Series and the Championship Tour. You've got equal prize money. Um, yeah. You have these things that, from a top-down perspective, have elevated women's surfing so much that we're now seeing kind of the fruits of that investment with young women coming up who have had so much more to look at compared to previous generations and previous generations had amazing talents too you know your margo right. oberds and um your lane beachleys and yeah. your lisa andersons and your sofia milanovic's and chelsea georgeson's all these like amazing women but they didn't necessarily have the platform to consistently perform on now right. you know your stephs and carissas and tyler's do um, yeah. and you're kind of seeing that, that ripple effect down the track. So I, th I do think it's a matter of time before you see a pretty significant structural change. Sweet. Looking forward to it. Um, this next question is from at Nath underscore Collins. Uh, will we see more of different sponsors on boards as opposed to traditional brands? 
Right. Uh, well, that's interesting. I, I assume by traditional brands, he probably means like surf surf industry or like endemic Endemics. brands. But yeah. yeah, I mean, when when I started um, with 05, 06, it was almost unheard of at the time for top surfers to have non-endemic sponsors. It was was really locked up tight by by the surf industry, which, you know, as we said before, like was very robust and powerful, like in the Audis, early Audis for sure. And, you know, the sport grew in large part because of that. And even before the 2012 acquisition of the ASP, now WSL, you saw brands like Nike and Target and whatnot leaning into the space and picking up surfers and, and sponsoring events. Certainly in the last few years, as surfing has continued to grow, we've seen a lot of non-endemic brands come into the space to support surfers and events and tours and content. And, and I would say for sure, you're going to see that continue to increase in the future. But I do think it's important to note that whether you are an endemic brand or a non-endemic brand and agnostic or where you put your money in surfing, right? Like if you're sponsoring a surfer or whatever it is, you know, success in my personal opinion, it always comes down to like quality and longevity and the clarity of purpose. Like if you know why you're yeah. sponsoring a surfer or sponsoring an event or a podcast and you're clear about it, then you can collaborate and, right. and build something that's really, really impactful. And we've seen plenty of proof cases over the years where it's worked and plenty that haven't. Um, so right. yeah, that's, that's my two cents anyway. You know, Miguel is someone who, who comes from somewhat outside of surfing. Like what's your read on like surf brands versus non-surf brands? Like it, like, like, cause that's a kind of a recent thing for you. I'm curious to get your take on like how much loyalty you feel like, well, I have to have this kind of a wetsuit or I have to have the, or you just kind of like, yeah, whatever's the best product I'm good for. <sighs> that's tough. Um, I mean, I think you broke it down really well, you know, that our core audience as surfers, like we all said, is like, it's such a big part of their identity that, you know, why would they wear wetsuit A from some random company or, you know, versus, or, you know, wetsuit B from some random company where they can wear wetsuit A from the company that they've known and trusted and loved their entire life. Um, so it's tough to say, but at the same time, you know, for this sport and for all of us to, I think, grow and succeed and do well, it, it has to grow. We, we have to start looking kind of outside in a way, but I think to answer the question, like you said, of why are we doing this in the first place? What's the real connection I think is where we got to start. Um, I don't think that, you know, you know, there's just certain, certain, um, companies that we work with. It just, it just seems like a great fit. And, you know, right now, for example, we just had, uh, Jerry Lopez aired today, um, in, you know, partnership with Patagonia and their new film, the yin and yang of Jerry Lopez. Everyone go check that out. It should be out by now. Um, it's a great film. But that just made sense. Like, you don't even have to write it down on paper. It's just like, well, yeah, duh. Like, so I think there's going to be some companies like that and some companies where we're going to have to think about it a little bit more. But ultimately, I think it's just a matter of um, whatever the company that we partner with or sp sponsors us. It's just a matter of, of answering that why. And if it makes sense, yeah. let's do it. <laughs> cool. A great, great answer. Great question. Uh, the next question is kind of weird but kind of interesting i guess <laughs> from at ali two beers um what do wsl surfers wear under their wetsuits what do you think <laughs> <laughs> what, what was the question I, I, I thought i heard it but i have <laughs> uh, what do wsl surfers wear under their wetsuits <laughs> I, I have no idea you'd have to ask that but that's, that's, that that answer has the benefit of being both safe and true um but i mean i i mean personally i don't wear anything but to each their own i've got no idea um but yeah yeah i don't know like i i mean no no free ads but like i i, I do know a lot of surfers under their board shorts and i guess like under their wetsuits i, I think you know women probably wear their their bathing suits under theirs maybe i don't know but the the I know some of the guys will wear sort of like whatever you call like performance underwear under yeah. the board shorts like and like one of the companies beneath BN3TH like has given me a few pair I've tried it and it, it's pretty radical like I don't think I'll ever not wear something like that when I wear my board shorts again haven't tried it under oh, the wetsuit I don't know if that's Let's what go. you're <laughs> yeah no free yeah. ads but I do appreciate the undies um, so. That's cool. <laughs> 
Feel free to sponsor the podcast. We just talked about yeah. it. So let's do it. Let's go. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. No, me too. Birthday suit all day. Yeah. Um, yeah. Board I will say my, my, card, so. my, my little guy, um, Kellen, uh, he serves and we're up north and so it's a little colder. And so, um, Oh, yeah. I if I leave him to get his wetsuit on, he will always put like board shorts on underneath. <laughs> if not, I'm just like let's go. That's come on. not the right way to do things. Well, <laughs> you know, it's you kind of he he. Uh, I was always like a real scrawny kid and would get my suits way too big from like playing against sports when I was growing up. And he's got the benefit of being <laughs> like I naturally built into like a wetsuit model, yeah. so his fit him like a glove, which is great. Yeah. Uh, but then I have to get like the jaws of life to get him out, so it's like a whole. Oh thing. god, yeah, yeah it's a good time. The, the person I went out with the first time, he just kind of, he's a type, um, shout out Daniel. He's a type that um, he won't even wear like the, the poncho hoodies and he'll just, he's still wrapping towels and stuff like that around and just very like, you know, to the core, the old ways, he'll never let them die. Still play oh, CDs yeah, I, in his car type of thing. And, oh, yeah, I guess, He said yeah. he never wears anything underneath his wetsuit. So I was like, oh, okay, that's probably the way to go. And then every now and Retro- then I'll see a couple people out there that, that have like those compression shorts and I'm like, Maybe I should, but yeah, yeah. I well, also I'm like I don't. I mean, I don't think it's gonna make much of a difference, but yeah, we'll see. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, cool. Now you guys know. Um, the next question is from at McKay underscore Holland. Uh, they ask for the CS. Why only keep top four results? Morgan's point point total was more than half of the qualifiers. Yep, that's a good question, and and yeah. and definitely one that you know the tours competitions office they they oversee kind of the structural integrity of the sport, so that's that's in their wheelhouse. But you know, for similar reasons why historically we've dropped a result um, on the championship tour, you know, the ocean is the most dynamic field to play in all the sports. It's always changing, and there is always the possibility that you fly halfway around the world and you have a 30 minute heat and the ocean goes flat and and that just happens, you know? And so I think the idea of not counting every single result is one in part to uh, kind of inoculate the, the overall performance from that oceanic randomness in a way. But secondly, too, I think especially looking with the surfers and working with the surfers, um, you know, traveling to seven international events is expensive, right? And so maybe you couldn't get to all seven. And and the Tours and Competition Office decided that your best four performances out of those seven opportunities, if you only surf four events, you only count those four. If you surfed all seven, you count your four best ones, was the right way to kind of assess who was doing well and who wasn't on the Challenger yeah. Series. And, you know, looking at both classes uh, men's and women's classes that are qualifying from the challenger series like they're probably the strongest two classes i've ever seen kind of advance up to the championship tour so i really think that 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 part of the redesign with the challenger series and the way it's working is is really really impressive yeah yeah that's a great answer um yeah i think uh you know kind of similar for like olympic I think it's like ice skating and snowboarding, the half pipe. They kind of do this judging. I was looking it up where they eliminate the, the highest score and the lowest score and then average the rest. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that's just a way to like mitigate some bias because um, this is a judging sport. And, you know, I don't think you can eliminate bias completely out of any judging. It's subjective in a sense. So I think maybe there's a way that like, you know, if a lot of these lower scores, there could have been some bias. It kind of like, okay, well, eliminates that. Um, so you don't have to think about your, your three lowest scores. So mm-hmm. I think maybe it's probably just more of an element of trying to add some fairness, um, you know, into, to, to this kind of framework and system that we, that the athletes, uh, operate in. Right. Cool. Uh, next question is from at Mike Sharp, 8128. What systems of infrastructure does a country need to produce world championship tour surfers asking for New Zealand? Good question. Um, I mean, there's not really like a tried and true answer, but we have a lot of like proof cases through history where we can kind of parse what's happened. I think, you know, priority one is, you know, having a country that has an abundance of good surf, ideally, and good surfers. And New Zealand has both in spades. Like New Zealand, I've been fortunate enough to go there. It's 
an awesome country. The waves are excellent. There's all kinds of waves. Um, the surfing community there is really, really strong. Some of the talent that's come out of there from, you know, Maz and Jay Quinn to Paige Harab, um, Ella Williams, um, who am I missing? Billy Stairman, like people who have made and haven't made the CT, but like just really, really good surfers. Um, Daniel Cariopa is another one. Um, it's it's awesome. It's awesome to watch them um, surf wherever we can watch. But I think historically, the, the best kind of infrastructure to produce CT talent is just having a robust domestic competitive circuit. You know, the, mm -hmm. the momentum generation of the 90s, which was primarily, you know, U.S. and Hawaii based, they came out of a, a system where there was a really strong domestic tour in, in America, you know, and they got a lot of live reps against each other in live competition and really got to sharpen their craft as surfers before they hit the international stage. And, you know, in the last decade, we saw the rise of the Brazilian storm. That was a direct result from having a really strong national series of events in Brazil, where all that talent was able to to develop. And, and we've seen the inverse, you know, I won't name countries, but there are countries out there that have maybe seen a downturn in opportunity for competition, countries and regions. Um, and even though they've had a lot of talented surfers, and even though they've invested in things like, you know, uh, uh, training camps and, and sort of sports science based uh, um initiatives which are all great like are all awesome things for athletes at the end of the day the the best thing that we've seen is you just have to have the contest and you have to have a strong domestic mm -hmm. series because that gets you the reps you need to to take it on against the world really yeah that's a great answer um cool and the last question to round out this segment is from at underscore brian russell underscore who asks, do you think the tour is heading in the right direction? If so, please state why. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, I mean, that's a, that's, that's the question I think. Um, right. and yeah, I absolutely do. Um, and I kind of go back to what we talked about you know, before, which is, you know, uh, are we seeing the best surfing we've ever seen in the live arena on the championship tour? I think for sure, you know, and that's a question I talked to the CT surfers about, I talked to past world champions about, and the answer is always the same. They go, absolutely. You know, they've never seen better surfing on tour. There has been a lot of change. Um, I think some of that change, it's, it's designed to encourage and progress the best surfing you're going to see. And, and I think that's working. I think there's other reasons that the surfing is getting better too, for sure. But I do think that the tour structure is a part of it. And kind of what we we're saying before, the most important thing, as far as I'm concerned, is stabilizing that framework. Um, so that the new generations have confidence that in two years time, this is what they're going to do in five years time. This is what they're going to do, or this is the, right. this is the opportunity ahead of them. Um, and they can believe it's going to be there and they can work towards that. And the company gets to a place where that's really stable and successful. And, and what we all agree is, uh, just amazing feats, um, that our men and women do across our disciplines are kind of recognized in a way that, that not only, not only sustains their own livelihoods, but inspires everyone that comes into contact with it. And I think, I think we're doing that in a way that um, is better than it's ever been done. And I think it's been doing a pretty good job of it for a long time. Yeah, I agree. And I think to add on to that, um, you know, you touched on it a little bit earlier, men and women getting equal pay and now more sports are following suit. And men and women compete in the same places. You know, the first ever Billabong Pipe Pro um, you know, this year it was the first one, right, Dave? Say that one more uh, time. Sorry, the first ever women's Billabong Pipe Pro was twenty twenty. Yes, yeah, yeah. It was the yeah. first first women's CT event at Pipe. Yeah, and you know, even with uh, WSL Pure, um, you know, they just released their uh, impact summary vi video um, for the UN, and and just seeing the impact that um, you know, like our sustainability committee and our nonprofit organizations are. You know working towards it's it's really cool and i mean i i don't know logistically like what it is but especially like the the commitment to not using any um non-reusable water bottles and just you know getting shipments of you know like box water for example i'm sure that there's a cost to that and a logistical challenge to that as well um but it, it's cool to see that commitment and as far as you know like you said the stabilization of the format there's um travis logie 
uh, was on the podcast um, a couple episodes, episode one, three, two, um, that you guys can check out, the listeners, where he really breaks down the system um, before this one, and it it just makes so much more sense. And you know, he was a former CT surfer. Um, same with Jesse, Miley, Dyer, and, and you know, they along with you know the other in the tours and comp system created this framework and system because they think it would have been more feasible for the surfers um especially financially and so i think seeing all these things kind of come into place and weave in and out to create this you know this organization and system and this framework that we operate in um is really cool to see come into fruition and with that uh that'll round off our second segment uh we're gonna get in a couple more questions but first we're gonna take one more quick break to get one more word in from our sponsors we'll be right back all right, so coming back, I think that last question was a great segue into our next segment here, kind of more of a look ahead with these questions. Um, so this first uh, question comes from at Jesse Giglio. Uh, what is a bold prediction or predictions for the upcoming World Championship Tour? <laughs> well, I mean, I try to stay away from the predictions business because um, <laughs> I mean, if my fantasy if surfer records want. anything to go off of, I yeah. don't, don't, oh don't, 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 don't go to any betting agency with what I'm about to say. But, um, <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, geez, you know, on the, on the women's side, there's so many interesting stories, you know, we've got Steph now kind of the undisputed um, we've got Carissa maybe yeah. reeling from 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 losing out on her sixth world title. You've got, you know, surfers like Joanne and Tati and Brisa and Lakey, Courtney and 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 Caroline and and the like. You know that that we're all kind of considered title contenders in their own right and haven't won one yet. You got Tyler Wright coming back. She's got two world titles. So. You know, I don't. I don't think I have a bold prediction for the women's championship tour. Aside from, I know there's a big generational shift that's happening coming up from the Challenger series, and and I guess my bold prediction would be that I I think it might still take them a few years to kind of hit their straps on the championship tour and some of these sort of, you know, apex predators that have been on the elite level for a while are. are still going to be fairly dominant at least next mm. season but that's that's my really general bold prediction on the women's side i mean on the on the men's side like i mean a bold prediction would be i don't think a brazilian is going to win the world title but i kind of think that after watching what gabriel's done this off season i have a hard time thinking anyone's going to beat him anywhere i mean it'll happen yeah. but it's he looks he looks pretty Ivan Drago. So maybe that's my <laughs> my my bold prediction is that I think Gabriel Medina will win the 2023 world title. Uh, oh, wow. Because it doesn't matter how good you are. Like, it's still pretty hard to guarantee that. But that's, yeah. I don't know. That That's what I see on the on the men's side. <laughs> what, what? Yeah, that's that's kind of it. Yeah, no, I, I think um, I was just kind of messing around with these ones. But I said Macy Callahan makes the final five. It's a good one. And then I said, uh, yeah, and I said, Kelly Slater will only surf Pipe, Australia, surf Ranch, J-Bay, and Tahiti just for fun. And um, he'll Interesting. be the rest of the events. Yes, I mean, that's, I those, I are, those are fair predictions. It's those bold, are fair right? Predictions. I mean, I don't know. I, I could be completely wrong. <laughs> I It could um, be, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, next question is from at lamarca.pedro, um, who says, or who asks, who are the rookies that will make the 2023 cut? All right. Ooh, well, um, yeah, I mean, on the women's side, right, you've got Katie Simmers and Sophie McCulloch. And then I, I guess Molly Picklum, although I think I'm trying to think what her status was because she surfed last year, but maybe as a replacement surfer. So maybe that wasn't her rookie season. So are we yeah. calling her rookie next year? I don't know. Um, of those three, I mean, they're all great surfers. Like, I kind of think that after watching what Sophie did at Haleiwa, she could be kind of a yeah, dark right. horse where obviously Molly and Picklum have gotten... Or Molly, Molly and Picklum. Molly and Katie have gotten a lot of attention and, and rightfully so. Right. But I do think sometimes that's a disadvantage because the expectations get really high and someone like Sophie can kind of sneak in under the radar and she's really, really good. Um, so she could really yeah. kind of punish people and... Yeah, I don't. I don't know. I don't know which of those three is not going to make it, but 
it wouldn't yeah. shock me if if none of them did. And then on the men's side, the, the true rookies would be Rio Waida from Indonesia, Maxime Husano from France, Ramsey Bukiam from Morocco, Ian Gentile from Hawaii. You know, again, I, I think they could all easily make it. I think the way that the the tour is structured now, you have some pretty like heavy waves in terms of how critical they are to before the cut, right? You've got Pipeline in prime season, you got Sunset Beach in prime season, you got Super Tubos in prime season, and then you've got Bells and Margaret River. You don't have what was historically the case at the start of the season where you'd have a relatively playful wave like a Snapper Rocks um, to do like high performance maneuvers on. So to that end, I, I think when you look at like power brokers and, and sort of surfers that have established themselves in critical waves like Ramsey Bukiam and Ian Gentile to take two of them, it wouldn't shock me if they did really well. Um, but then, you know, Ian, uh, sorry, not Ian, uh, Rio, Rio Wida and, um, who am I missing here? Um, I'm missing one of the rookies. Oh, sorry. Rio Wida and Maxime, they're no slouches either. Like they're, they're so deadly in so many ways. So I, again, mm -hmm. not answer cause I'm not in the predictions business, but that's sort of my general <laughs> breakdown uh, of what I see on the rookies. No, that's great. Um, I think to add on to that then, um, is actually this next question is at Willie Goat 0230. Okay, team, predictions for 2023 season rookie of the year, men's and women's. <laughs> These predictions are getting more specific. Um, <laughs> we got a couple predictions coming up. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, well, I mean, on the women's side, I would say if Molly is a rookie, then I think Molly would be rookie of the year. Um, and, and Katie is amazing. Like, I'm not trying to take that away from her i just think that molly's had a few runs at the ct level so i think that helps a lot um and yeah. she's hugely yeah, talented sure. too and then on the and then sophie I, again i think she's going to be great dark horse yeah and oh then God. on the on the men's side if i had to pick one of them i mean i like ramsey but he's the goofy footer yeah. um so <laughs> i'm gonna back him but i just i've <laughs> i've go. honestly just had like more experience watching him surf because He's well. They've all been around, knocking at the door for a while. But Ramsey, I think he he's been right there at the CT level for a long, long time, and I think his brand of surfing should translate pretty well to that to that level. Yeah, I'm excited to see that. Um, so the next prediction question is from at k dot um, <laughs> who asks prediction for men's and women's CT championships this next year. Who's going to win the world title? Or, Is that the question? Yeah, wait, I, I read that wrong. Hold on. Uh, prediction no, okay. for men's and women's CT champions this next year. So yeah, who wins the world title? Oh, this is going to get us in trouble. Um, <laughs> I mean, I, I will add, I just, just on a general rule, knock on wood, but most people that come on the podcast tend to do really well, like almost immediately. Yeah. So it's, <laughs> it's, I'm not saying there's a cause and effect, but I am suggesting there's something supernatural going on. Um... <laughs> Jeez, you know what? Like, I'll, okay, I'm gonna run it back with Steph. Like, I think Steph has entered into a new phase of her career. I know a lot of people had kind of written her off because surfing's constantly trying to move on from people who achieve things, and mm. I think that actually seeped into the way Steph looked at herself and looked at her career and looked at mm. her ability. And I think that doing what she did at Lowers last year kind of like reignited something for her to the point where if she came out and started winning a bunch of mm. events this year, it wouldn't surprise me. And I think she's, yeah. and if she gets into the final five, I think the way that you'd look at it, if you're her, you're like already did the hardest thing imaginable at trestles. I went from fifth right. to win, you know, like yeah. in, and frankly, like you look at someone like a Brisa or a Tatiana or a Joanna or Carissa, like, and the conditions on that day, like they could have easily challenged Steph, you know, but Steph yeah. did it, you know? So I, yeah. I kind of back in Steph for another world title. And I'd, I'd like I to see that. someone start to start to glance at, uh, Kelly's 11. Like I'm, I'm into right. it. And cool. then, um, on the men's side, I kind of already said it, but it, it does, it does seem like Gabriel Medina is out to prove something in 2023. Mm -hmm. And so I, I wouldn't be surprised if he was a uh, world champ at the end of the year. Yeah. What about you? What are your picks, Miguel? I, I picked John Florence. He just looks too good. Just, oh man, looks great. And then I actually picked Brisa Hennessy. Oh, okay. Um, 
I, I, look, I don't, you know, take my my choices to, to betting, like you said, but um, I think she learned a lot from her appearance at this year's WSL Finals, and I think she's going to take that and rampage in 2023. But I think ultimately, kind of backing what you said, you got to look at who's the hungriest. I feel like that consistent kind of through line between the surfers who are always at the top are just so hungry to win. Like they're, it's, they're, their prime focus is to win. Um, you know, and they, they, I think they balance that out with, you know, well, I go out there, I paddle out, I just try to remember to be present, have fun, etc. But there's, there's like, there's a lion in these surfers, you know, that's just like, you know, a monster coming out that just, they, they just want to win. Um, but yeah. I like it. Cool. Next question coming from at Jack Ho Ho Luck. Uh, not really a question, but he says, get Jake Marshall on. <laughs> on the podcast <laughs> um, i guess <laughs> yeah yeah on yeah. something um yeah no that's yeah. not a question but sure i mean i i think he was san diego's first qualifier for the ct since taylor Knox was on tour so that is some Sick. shameful shit san diego um now we have <laughs> now, now we have katie simmers too but yeah we should absolutely yeah. get jake on the pod he'd be he'd be interesting um we'll but, get him on at some point well jake and team just like dave says you know if you come on the pod Something supernatural happens, he might win a CT. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, <laughs> yes, that's right. That's right. Cool. Uh, next question comes from at Todd10372. When is the Challenger Series draw announced for next year? The draw, maybe the calendar? Um, Guess so. Yeah. Um, all right, well, maybe he does mean the field. It's a, it, Okay, so I'll, I'll give him two answers. The field, um, because the Challenger Series is now our second of the three tiers, so the field for the Challenger Series comes from the different regions. So we've got seven different regions, and so they, they bring in sort of prorated amount of surfers depending on the regional strength. Um, and the regional qualifying series are all different, but they will essentially finish before the opening event of the year. So probably sometime in like March or April, you'll know who is going to compete from those regions. And then the calendar, I mean, I might be wrong, maybe it is released, but if it's not, it'll probably get released in sometime in January. Okay. Uh, Looking, uh, something to look forward to for sure. Um, Next question is from at thomas.hearse. Can we get the break room back for 2023? (laughs) Yeah, I really like the break room episodes. One. Yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> we had a lot, of, and we actually, you know, they got like a lot of good feedback about them. But um, yeah, I think at the end of the day, you know, pulling the curtain back on, you know, people who work at the WSL is a good thing because, you know, it shows that we're all just human beings like anyone and we're just working a job and trying to do something we believe in. And I think it's always interesting to get perspectives from people that do the work, right? Like, um, so yeah, I, I like the break room. I don't know if we'll bring it back in the same way we did it, but I, there might be some changes to the podcast in 2023. We'll see what happens. Got a conference room or some pizza, just set cameras everywhere. Well, well, yeah, I, think, I don't think we did. I don't think we did any of them live. Like, I think it was live. all like all digital, but yeah. <laughs> Hey, if there's going to be pizza, I'll end up there. So no problem. There you go. Cool. Coming up into our last couple of questions. Uh, this next one is at, from at Mats on Colbert, Mats and Colbert, who asks three people you haven't spoken to or three people you haven't yet spoken to, but would be dream guests for the show. That's a great question. Oh, yeah, I mean, it's, I, this is sort of weird to admit. I haven't really thought about it um, that much, but I probably should. I, <laughs> I don't know. Generally, like, pretty happy to have anyone on the show. Uh, off the top of my head, uh, Sean Doherty. I'd like to talk to him. He's a All journalist right. from Australia that was I was a huge and remain a huge fan of. I was a big fan growing up. Uh, Silvana Lima. I'd love to talk to her. Uh, she was on the championship tour, on the women's championship tour when I was working on that tour. And she's an awesome person. Um, and it's kind of like a Brazilian storm unto herself. I'm excited to talk to her. And then uh, that's two. Um, oh, uh, you know, Eric Arakawa, um, Hawaiian surfboard oh, cool. shaper. Be cool to talk yeah. to him. Yeah, I don't know. Sweet. But really anyone, anyone come on. I'd be happy to talk to anybody. Yeah, um, I have some three. Can I give my three? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, let's hear it. Let's kind hear of, it. 
it's kind of a group three, but um, I thought the Red Hot Chili Peppers would be awesome. We just had Kelsey Gonzalez, the bass of the Free Nationals on, and um, that was really cool to kind of get his take on surfing. Um, but I know Anthony and Flea, you know, they'd be great to have for Surf Congo, and then obviously having John Fugiante and Chad Smith. I mean, come on, that'd be so great to have them on. Um, just amazing musicians. Um, and then I think, obviously, for obvious reasons, Kelly, Gabby, Ethan, Betty Lou, Katie, those, that crew would be awesome. Um, I'm, I'm totally cheating here, but actually what would really be cool too, I thought about this earlier, was like, if we could even maybe get Liv Stone on. Um, she just won an ISA World Parasurfing Championship in Pismo Beach, and now she's a three-time champion. And she was actually a fellow intern with me. Um, but she's, uh, she's a huge inspiration, I think, to me and to a lot of people, and I think would be a really cool guest to have. Those um, are great. Yeah, yeah Liv, Liv's is, rad. Yeah, she's awesome. Um, my third is actually a more of a Dreamcast one, but I discovered Drew Harrison through Five Summer Stories and found out that he was born in Hawthorne, where I lived for a little bit, and from Hermosa Beach, which is pretty much my stomping ground. So he's a style hey. master, and if we could have him on... That would have been amazing, but, you know, rest in peace. <laughs> Be a hard one to book. I know. <laughs> Maybe in the next life. Um, now, for our final question for the end of the year mailbag, is from at Anna Belichick. Dave, will you please answer your own rapid response questions? Uh-oh. After three years, Dave. I feel like I've done <laughs> it, but let, let's go. Yeah. yeah, maybe I've just done it in my head too many times. Yeah, let's roll. Okay, I, well, all right, yeah. let's do this. Hopefully I don't mess this up, but uh, <laughs> now it's... <laughs> all right, now it's time for the lightning round. Dave, these are 10 questions for you to answer as quickly as you can. You ready? I'm ready. All right. If you could only have one board set up for the rest of your life, single fin, twin fin, thruster, quad, bonzer, or finless, which would you choose? Well, I, I, guess, I guess I haven't done this before, but in my head, I, <laughs> I, think, I feel like I was always answering, I wanted, I'd I do a two, a two plus one, which is like a twin right. fin with a trailer. But right. as of very recently, I'm trying to like Benjamin button my surfing a little bit. So I'd probably say thruster today. I'll try to say thruster okay. forever be my answer all right for a second there i thought you were gonna say single fan i'm like all right <laughs> hey you know i i i don't knock it it's a good option right for sure uh coffee or tea uh coffee from heavenly cakes donuts in oxnard thank you to moni and olivia for always being so kind to everyone but it's oh, good coffee awesome now you just aired out your favorite coffee spot it's gonna be packed hey uh, yeah that I get there early. I'm not worried about that. So. All right, yeah. No worries. <laughs> uh, burrito or pizza? Yep, love them both, but I believe the burrito is the more versatile choice. You can have really? one for breakfast, lunch, or dinner. So. All right, okay. I, uh, admittedly, I could, I, could, I could eat pizza for breakfast, lunch, or dinner too. But yeah, I just flatbreads? Think, yeah, yeah. I just feel like the, the burrito is like a, I'm tricking myself no, into thinking it. it's a healthier option. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> for sure. Uh, last book you ever read? Uh, Moon Witch, Spider King by Marlon James. Nice. Yep. Um, best surf film ever? Well, after uh, re-watching it for the podcast a few weeks ago, Five Summer Stories <laughs> by Greg McGillivray. I, I feel like uh, that's, that's the goat for me on surf films. It's awesome. Just standing by at your desk. Here we go. That's right. Yep. <laughs> there it is. See, it's right the there. The VHS. Got always. the receipts. Yep. <laughs> uh, where am I? One wave you never have to go back to. Mm. Um, okay. So so this is not a knock on the wave or the town or the okay. surfers who surf there every day, but I <laughs> personally have just never been able to surf it well. So it's almost always a disaster <laughs> for me. And that is uh, T Street in San Clemente. Um, oh, I will. It, I will inevitably end up surfing there again, but um, no, I don't have yeah. to, and I probably shouldn't. All right. Uh, if you could only get to surf one wave for the rest of your life, uh, Diba Duramba with uh, five percent of the crowd. I think so. <laughs> um, I love that spot. It's something you know different every time. There's rights. There's lefts. There's barrels. There's turn sections. It's beautiful water. Yeah. It's always fun. Yeah, I love Diba. If I, I've, if I could replicate a spot, I'd do that in, in a heartbeat. 
Are you going to Australia this year? I don't know. Maybe. But it's, I, but we used to go. I I guess to like to round that one off. Like we used to go like sometimes months before the first event. We go out there and we'd work and we'd you know plan for the year and stuff. So I spent a lot of yeah. good time on the Gold Coast and. As a goofy sure. footer, you're like, yeah, the points are nice, but like, I'd like to go left. And even though you end up at Duramba on the rights are probably better than the left, but it was always, I just was felt like, oh, this is kind of my little sanctuary. So I, I, I this is a fond, fond, fond place in my heart for that space. Oh, that's really cool. Yeah. Uh, next question. Best person to share a lineup with? Oh, my kids or um, my kids or Pat O'Connell. Cause he's a good vibes kind of guy. Oh, cool. Yeah. 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 Uh, worst person to share a lineup with. Yep. Um, I don't have an answer on this one. I've, I've been in the oh, water okay. with CT surfers for decades at this point, but uh, I, you know, anytime I'm out there, I always try to stay out of their way since they're there for work and I'm there for fun, yeah. I guess. Yeah. Um, so we don't really overlap. <laughs> it's kind of like we're, it's a good symbiotic lineup if we're both out there because we're like, they're like, that's a Dave wave. That's a CT wave. Like it's pretty clear yeah, yeah. At, most fair. of the time. Yeah. At, at most spots. <laughs> Um, but yeah, you occasionally like just as a surfer, you run into people out there with just like absolutely no self awareness, and even yeah, yeah. you know objectively decent surfers who just think they're so much better than they really are. And um, yeah. yeah, so that's always like an unpleasant time if you can't get away from them. <laughs> but it's yeah, that's, I don't really have like a single person. <laughs> well, no, but see, no, no, no. So I'll 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 recap. Like I don't. I mean, we haven't surfed together, but I do not consider yeah. you someone that lacks self awareness, you know, and and that oh, I'm thanks. I'm sort of cribbing a Dane Reynolds answer from back in the day because someone asked him what a kook was, and he, I'm going to paraphrase, <laughs> but it was like he's like it has nothing to do with surfing ability and everything to do with self awareness, mm -hmm. and he said, you know, I've been out wow, in the water with good surfers who have no idea how yeah. they surf they just think they're way better than they are, and it's awful. And he said at the same time, I've been out with beginners who know exactly how they surf. And he goes, one's a kook and one isn't. Like, it's just, it has to do with being, like, respectful and polite and knowing knowing where you're at, you know? That's a great answer. Yeah. All right, well, you heard it here first. I'm not a kook. There you go. Uh, la <laughs> last question. Finish this sentence. I will next achieve a state of happiness by... Yeah, I... I By just sitting here, I think I'm doing all right right now. You know, I'm... I'm fortunate enough to be um, healthy enough to do the things I like to do or be unfortunate for you know family and friends and yeah I'm I'm doing all right I always was like what am I going to say here but I you know just being present and appreciate it, appreciative would be my answer yeah that's a absolutely that's a great answer well Dave Proden thank you thank you so much for all you do uh for the lineup for the WSL for the culture of surfing in general it's 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 truly an honor to get to work with you um and i'm looking forward to what we do uh together and working more uh on the lineup for 2023 and beyond right on thanks miguel i appreciate you appreciate everything you do for the podcast and uh yeah thanks to everyone who wrote in and and to echo miguel like if we didn't get to your question like or comment send them on in we, we try to respond to everybody and appreciate everyone listening to the podcast and everyone coming on and all the all the sponsors that support the conversations it's it really means a lot and uh yeah i think we're gonna have some fun stuff on on tap for 2023 so i hope everyone has a a good holiday break and they get some waves and spend some time with the people they love and uh yeah we're gonna be back we're back with a vengeance real quick in january so i'm Let's looking forward go. to it all right thanks dave that's a wrap thanks